Hello and welcome to Critical Line Item. My name's Tom Rabbit. Thank you so much for joining me for this particular podcast. Uh, it's been a while for me to be able to get time in my get, for, get time in the diary of my guest today, but it's going to be a worthwhile conversation. He's an author, he's an academic, and he's a journalist all rolled into one. There were two, and very prolific at that. The two books came out last year, How Good Is Scott Morrison, co-authored with Wayne Errington, as well as a book called Who Dares Losers, who are pariah policy politics. Um, also co-authored with Kate Wayne Errington. I'm, I'm talking about Peter Van Onselen. He, uh, he also hosts um, or co-hosts a little program on television, which you may have heard of, called The Project, as well as does a lot of the work behind the scenes for Channel 10 and politi- as political editor. And um, another podcast as well with Hugh Rimmerton called The Professor and the Hack. Hugh, thank you. Well, 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 not you, but Peter, thank you for joining me. <laughs> G'day, Tom. Good to be with you. It's an early day. Um, it, the thing that fascinates me about you and the work you do is uh, your history. You've got a PhD, you're a professor. Um, can, I mean, can you tell us what your doctorate is in? Yeah, sure. I uh, so I, I did uh, I did my honours thesis on the electoral viability of the Australian Democrats, um, which, in a sense, in keeping with uh, the view now that I I'm I'm, I'm the kiss of death in making predictions. Uh, any read back of that honours dissertation would confirm an early start to that because uh, I, I didn't see the departure of Cheryl Kerno coming. I didn't see. Uh, some of the problems that they face subsequently being eroded by the Greens coming. Uh, and therefore, my conclusion, which was, uh, you know, affirmed with a, a 1A uh, honours dissertation, uh, doesn't look so good as far as political cephology goes, because I thought their electoral viability looked so, so you've been, you, So you've been stuffing this up for years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. No, 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 I mean, and, I did... and, you've, and you've kept it hidden from everybody, have you? <laughs> well, it's, it's there. It's I mean, a... you can go. People can go to UNSW. It's all on the public record, and they, if they, if they really have time on their hands uh, and aren't interested in doing anything better, they can go and read my honours dissertation. But look, I, I, did, <laughs> I did, I did, obviously say in it that um, that you know the electoral viability of the Democrats, whilst I think it looks solid, uh, it only takes two bad elections, you know, with two half senate elections gone wrong for them to lose party status, lose funding, and then you know the downward spiral begins. So the mechanism for the end of the party I described, I just predicted so academically I, I got it right, but I predicted cephology wise that it was not looking likely. And then of course it happened not that long after to be frank. Uh, but that was the honest thesis. The PhD I turned up in WA uh, and Campbell Sharman was my PhD supervisor to start with before he moved to Canada. Uh, and then he became my sort of secondary supervisor. But I moved for him uh, because of his research around minor parties and, and institutions, particularly upper houses as well. And I started being interested when I walked in. I remember walking in and proudly handing over to him my uh, bound uh, honours dissertation and saying I was looking to do some sort of extension on this, maybe a wider look at minor parties. And after the sort of obligatory niceties, I, I had a thought when I walked back into his office that I wanted to follow up with him and found my honours dissertation sitting in his bin. Uh, and I sort of looked at him and it was great because it avoided 12 months, this is what he told me anyway, it, it avoided 12 months of needing to be nice, let's just get down to brass tacks. Uh, you know, you're doing a PhD now, I'm not interested in you expanding on your honours. Hello. Sorry, Tom. I, I, my cheek pushed up against the mute button. Um, long, long story short, uh, I ended up doing. I ended up doing my honours, uh, my PhD rather, on major party senators. So I moved away from the minor parties and started to look at not the role of major party senators in committees uh, and therefore their institutional role, which was pretty well. Well, reasonably well written about academically. Uh, my, my doctorate looks at their professional party role. Uh, in other words, what they do when they're in their home state uh, for their party. And essentially, they're a form of shock troops, uh, electorally speaking. They you know, have duty and patron electorates where they offer assistance, particularly either in marginal seats held by their own party or in uh, seats that they want their party to pick up where they base themselves because there's no 
you know, there's no sitting MP already there for their side of politics. And, and then that unpacks other things, you know, the role of bicameralism, is this a misuse, uh, how is the reality of this professional or otherwise and how where might it go? Uh, and, you know, how does it compare, I suppose, to some other upper houses around the world in, in terms of the electoral professional way that those MPs function? Uh, it's an interesting point uh, that you raise in, in there in terms of senators being shock groups. Is that part of the reason why we see a lot more senators pop up on the media, et cetera, because they don't have a House of Reps electorate where all the queries might go to a, a member of parliament yeah. in the lower house. They've got a little bit more time on their hands to whack the opposition. Well, na naturally, the Senate attracts more factional operators usually because to get pre-selection, and that was in the thesis too, to get pre-selection, you tend to have to be a factional operator and, and have central support of one form or another from one faction or the other. Uh, so that's the first factor. But then, yes, because they don't have, you know, we see maverick lower house MPs who sort of say what they think and want, but because senators don't have a constituency that's geographically based other than their entire state, which can vote them out, uh, they can sometimes be a bit more robust on broader issues, which might be risky for a, for a lower house MP because there could be a backlash in their individual electorate. So that's sometimes why we see them out talking. But my thesis sort of crunched the numbers a little bit on things like over the years doing a track of the office locations even as one example of senators. And as modern political parties professionalised, those senators as a percentage of where they locate their office were increasingly being housed in marginal seats. You know, the, the Australian Electoral Commission considers a seat of five or less percent a marginal seat. They were increasingly in those seats rather than in safe seats. Now, not all do it. A lot of them locate themselves in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Offices, for example, city to city. But I'm talking about the percentage shift showing a trend uh, over time. And, and then that was part of what the thesis unpacked as well. Now, am I right in saying the book that's sitting on Booktopia called Professionals or Part-Timers, Major Party Senators in Australia, which people can get, it's thirty nine ninety nine on Booktopia. Is that the one? That, that, that's all based on your PhD, correct? Yeah. It's, look, it's what I would describe that as, uh, not mean, meaning this as negatively as it perhaps sounds, is that it's a, it's a very dumbed down version of the PhD. So that particular book, I like the, you know, the doctorate's 100,000 words and, and got lots of gumph in there that doctorates have to have, as you well know, uh, that is the sort of 50,000 word version, uh, which just gets down to the brass tacks of the outcomes, if you like, rather than all the padding <laughs> that you have to put in a PhD so that they give you those letters before your name. The interesting thing about your co-author, uh, Wayne Errington, and that are, we can touch on the two books that, that, have been come, that have come out over the past couple of years, uh, uh, you know, How Good Is Scott Morrison and the one on pariah you know, politics. Mm. Um, what is it like writing with a, with a co-author uh, that still sort of has a foot in the academe? Yeah, well, look, I almost don't know what it's like when it comes to book writing, to not write with Wayne, to be honest, because I've done a version of my PhD as a book and I've edited a collection, which isn't the same as writing a book without him. And even then I got him to do a chapter in it. Uh, and I did one other book with another fellow uh, as a co-authored book. But every other book that I've done, um, which I think is five, I might be one out, uh, are all with Wayne. And we shared an office together doing our PhDs at UWA. Uh, and he went into academia after that at roughly the same time that I did. Uh, and he's now at Adelaide Uni. He was at ANU before that. He's always been an academic and he's not been interested in the popular writing. We, we started writing op-eds together, uh, but, you know, that wasn't that was something that fascinated him, I think, because he hadn't done it. And once he'd done it, he wanted to sort of stay in the academic world. So he publishes, beyond the books that we publish, he publishes still in scholarly journal articles, uh, with other academics as well as on his own. I used to do that with him as well, but since I've moved into the media, it's only the books that we do together now. Uh, what's it like? He, um, like Wayne and I, because we've done it for so long and known each other for so long and are friends too, obviously, uh, we, we write over the top of each other. So we're not, some authors uh, or co-authors, you know, they, they divvy up chapters, they're 
quite precious about their words versus the other. Uh, we don't <laughs> even keep we don't even keep track changes uh, when we go back and forth. I'm sorry. Uh, we we don't even keep track changes. Uh, I thought you, we, and that's what I thought I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. So we we literally will just change something and then it goes back to the other person. I mean, obviously we're keeping references so that we don't get the facts wrong, but um, it becomes a case of <laughs> this doesn't happen very often, but occasionally there'll be something that one of us or well, both of us really are changing every time it goes back and forth. And then eventually, you know, it can be quite minor, but it could be about a particular person or about a particular policy. Eventually, at the end of that process, after a couple of times, we'll be on the phone and we do talk a lot in between sending it back and forth. Uh, in one of the conversations, we'll eventually be like, all right, what's going on here? Why do you feel strongly? Whereas nine times out of 10 or, or more like 99 times out of 100, um, the person who changes it more than once, the other person go thinks to themselves, "Well, I don't violently object, so we move on." Um, and that's yeah, that's that's. I think it's quite so unusual. It's, it's, it's authorship by consensus, and anything that you disagree in is exception only, right? Exactly, and you know, in, in other words, it leaves a situation where, in theory, we could go through. Not that we'll ever do this, but in theory, you could go through page by page in books that we've written together. And there will be things for both him and for me, which I would read and think, well, look, I'm not entirely sold on that, but I just don't object. In other words, the other author was the one that felt more strongly about it, but I didn't feel strongly enough not to have my name next to it. Uh, so it's fine, uh, you know, and sure. that's why you find yourself, both him and I do this, you, you find yourself focusing potentially on particular parts of the book that you're you know, most interested in or most wedded to uh, rather than others. I'd say something funny, though, uh, the, the How Good Is Scott Morrison book, which, which, which has a question mark in the title. I always want to tell people that. We're not saying how good is he. We're asking how good is he uh, and then try to answer it in the book. Well, you, to some you know, you, you, it's not a declaration that Scott Morrison is good. It's a, it's a question in seeking others to determine it, isn't it? You, you, exactly. You, 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 that title is an invitation to discourse rather than a uh, rather than a final uh, declaration of goodness. That's exactly right. And and one thing I think I don't want to put words in his mouth, but one thing that I think <laughs> I think Wayne from that book would say the thing that I pushed for that he conceded on most uncomfortably so, but nonetheless he went along with it would be the conclusion in the book that Scott Morrison is likely to win the next election. I think from, even when that looked more likely than it does now, and I-, I you, 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 want to take, you, want, you want to take your co-author down with a prediction bigot. Well, this is the funny thing. I think that was <laughs> always something that left him a little uncomfortable, but I felt very strongly about it that, you know, I think he's the favourite to win the next election. And so Wayne went along with and it. You and you haven't, course, you haven't shifted. I, no, I, I haven't shifted. I mean, look, with a couple of days to go before the election, uh, if not before, if, if something changes, I'll change my view. I mean, I've always been a John Maynard Keynes fan on that one. If the facts change, I'll change my mind. At the moment for me, and don't get me wrong, I think it's close and I don't say this comfortably uh, or wantonly and I say it aware that if, you know, if my sort of life was on the line and I had to predict the election correctly between Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison, I'm still saying I think Scott Morrison will scrape home, but boy, would I be sitting uncomfortably waiting to find out whether I'm accurate or not? I'm just trying to make but the this, point that I think. This is a, how much of this stuff, so let's get on the predictions now, because mm. this is interesting. How much of this stuff um, out there in the wilderness, you know, where we, where we look at you know, other journalists and the way they talk about things on Twitter and elsewhere, how much of election prediction is heart and head? Um, That's a bit, bit of a mixture, I think. I mean, I, look, I, I should say this. I consider making predictions just the cephology, the fun side of, of having a crack and being more than happy to be baked when you're wrong. You know, it's, it's not, I don't consider it remote. So applying, so applying to the US the, uh, uh, in 2019 wasn't problematic to you? No, no, it's, 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 just a, it's just a bit of fun. And you make a prediction so that you can either gloat or get attacked. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, you, if, if, if this was purely a scholarly exercise or you were being conservative and weren't prepared to, if you like, have fun poked at you or parade around as though you've just kicked a goal in soccer uh, for the fun of it. It's all, it's all just theatre and optics. You just wouldn't make the predictions. You know, Jared Henderson hates making predictions. He always talks about how he will not make a prediction. I, I, I come from a different school of thought on this. I, I'm happy 
more than happy to be wrong. In fact, I expect to be wrong, hopefully less than half the time, but potentially half the time or more. Um, and that's that's the fun of it. You know, if, if it was about, it, I don't tie credibility as a political analyst to your predictions. Now, I think, you know, probably if you got them wrong too many times consecutively, you start to wonder what's going on. But predictions are just the fun part at the end of the analysis. And things can change too. You know, you, you make a prediction and then things change and you make a, a new one just before polling day. So even at the last... Well, election, the, you know, the, I, the Bureau of Meteorology changes <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. At, at, at whatever point in day. My, my Google device that I've got in front of me at the moment tells me Clayton South is 28 degrees and partly cloudy right now. <laughs> well, this is the thing, and like, like the the one that most gets used against me. Interestingly, it was the first podcast and the first two minutes of the first podcast I'd ever done, which was the first Professor in the Hack with Hugh. Yeah. And you know, I remember it. We were sitting face to face at that point in time. It wasn't over Zoom, and you know, <laughs> we were in this sort of room. There was no one else in there except one sound tech, and. Straight away, he said to me, "You know, what do you think? Can Scott Morrison uh, can can Scott Morrison win the election?" And I said, "Surely not. You know, he can't win this election. Uh, there's no chance he will." And I'm happy to have it replayed time and time again if he does. And that's always where it cuts off when people quote it or replay it. The next line, Tom, paraphrased, was me saying words to the effect of, "I'm happy to have it replayed time and time again if I'm wrong, because the comeback will be so spectacular." that I'll love having watched it and reported on it and be able to analyze and discuss it. But of course, <laughs> without that part on it, it just sounds like this incredibly arrogant declaration um, that can't be wrong. Uh, and you know, look, that's not what it was. I don't mind that people slice it off there because I said the words, um, but it wasn't, you know, as we got closer to the election, for example, um, on the morning of the election, I was trying to sort of put the seats together for a Labor victory. And I was saying to colleagues, and I think I even said it on air, that whilst I was sticking to the prediction when the election count started that night that Labor would win and that Bill Shorten would form government, I actually made the point that I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't find the seats when I went through them one by one. In the end, we went backwards, so it was much worse than people thought. But I couldn't find the seats when I went through them one by one, but I just assumed that there would be a sufficient move on, that those seats would materialise on the night. They didn't. Uh, and not that anyone cares about this, but this I consider the more the more academic end of political cephology. On the night of the election, actually, when you get the data coming in and you're forecasting the trends based on where preferences are likely to flow and yep. how the count is looking, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure I was the first mainstream commentator, at least on air, to call that election uh, on the night. Uh, but of course, that sits juxtapositioned with I was clearly one of the ones with egg all over my face uh, because I uh, because I made the now, a, a spectacularly inaccurate prediction sometime before that. There is something that I spoke with Col Samaras, Col Samaras, the former Labor uh, campaign director down here in Victoria. He did the job for fourteen years. I did a podcast with him the other the other week. He basically came to the table and said, and, and this is possibly a reason why your prediction. You to the tentative about Morrison actually winning as opposed to Albanese. Samaras has basically said that there's a whole raft of people he's spoken to as part of his sort of research and focus mm. group work that are looking at shifting away from both major parties and the Greens and going with the others like the Clive Palmers of this world. And it's yep. typical, it'll be difficult for people to actually call this without a, without a qualifier. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is an election that it, it's more a case of if you say to me, you have to predict one side or the other, what do you think? That's the point in time where I say, well, if I have to choose, I'm reluctantly, underconfidently sticking with Morrison winning. But if you give me the third choice, which is just to say, I'm stuffed if I know, that's the one I pick. Because it's this this election is, is really hard to Pit. But it's, it's pandemic, you know. When you look at analysts like the the, the samaras, they're all looking at, um, they're all looking at the impact of the pandemic, and then and, and the it's so different, we... Tom. It's so different state to state. Uh, the, yeah. the only thing I think I can rule out is that I don't <laughs> see Scott Morrison winning big. So I think that's gone. I think that's now off the table. 
Yeah. Uh, I think even, even his best case scenario would be that he somehow retains a lot of these seats in states around the country that people think he's going to lose. Uh, and then he does pick up some Labor seats in New South Wales. So his majority is reconfirmed, which he doesn't technically have at the moment. And then it, he maybe goes one or two above that. That's yeah, his kind of thing best is you get, case. The, the problem for you with other people who watch politics for years who've looked at it, who've spoken to the players, is you, nobody knows where the preferences are going to flow when people go in and potentially vote UAP. Oh, absolutely. Whereas at the last election, the UAP, just as the example you're using, they were so anti-Shorten, uh, you know, with their campaign. And so you kind of knew, A, anyone who voted for them, the preferences were likely to flow back to the coalition. But, B, the Im- but B, even if they didn't get much of a vote for those preference flows, the impact of their ad campaigns was very anti-Shorten and therefore anti-Labor and therefore helped Morrison. This time, the Palmer United Party looked to me like they're more likely, firstly, to take votes off the coalition rather than Labor. And then the question is, do they return on preference flows or not? Who knows? And secondly, their ad campaign, when it really gets ramped up, and we already see a lot of it because there's so much money on the Palmer side of the ledger, but when it really ramps up, I think it's more, I think it's just as likely, if not more likely, uh, to come across as anti government and anti Morrison as it is to be anti Labor, unlike the last time. Well, it's, it, 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 um, what we have right now is a very strong anti government climate, in, particularly in Victoria. Mm. Um, so they could be the coalition federally could be losing votes, Labor at state level, or rather, Labor could be losing votes because of pandemic management uh, by Andrews. You don't know. Yep, and and, and those distinctions, state by state, are, are really hard to track and follow, uh, which is why this is going to be such an interesting election. You know, the the not just the impact of the pandemic on the election, uh, but then also the impact of how the pandemic has played out state by state on the election. It's going to be a difficult one for there to be anything resembling a coherent national message from either side of the major party divide. Now, one of the, one of the interesting things for anybody in media, and to the, to this, is a, this is a segue, uh, and in part, you know, the whole thing about you know, causing a fuss in terms of votes and but votes and everything else and predictions is part of this. Um, but there are some serious issues that, that we all write about and from time to time as journalists, as commentators, um, we, get a, we get a fairly uh, solid blowback and you've had a bit of that over the past 12 months, particularly with, uh, with some of the stuff that happened this week over your, your opinion piece related to Grace Tame and, and the photographs and everything else. Yep. I don't want to relitigate the discussion you had on the project anybody <laughs> anybody that anybody that wants to view that can look at it on twitter you know 50 or 100 times if they wish and i and i would encourage them to, to have a look at it i i retweeted it uh so I, I i i have i don't shy away from the discussion i i do i do take issue with the claim by some that i was interrupting amy and carrie uh, i i think to the extent that i did i was sort of answering the criticism or the questions, but I, I spoke a hell of a lot less than uh, than they did uh, about something that was very and much there'll directed be people, at I me. Mean, people, there'll be people on Twitter who will probably who will probably say that <laughs> you should have. But let, let, let me get on to the <laughs> let me get on to the next point, which is irrespective of that, um, uh, and also some of the stuff that went on with, with, with the, sort of the insiders last year sure. and all of that. Park it, park, park those instances for a moment. We're all human, and even when we write things, there are time, there are times when, in in quiet moments, there are moments of reflection. At any point over the past twelve months, has there has it been when you write? You can't take words back, obviously, when they're written. Mm. But are there times when you write? Um, when you look at you look at something or, or a screenshot of something that appears on social media, and you turn around and say, "Oh, maybe I could have phrased that better on the day." Oh, of course, yeah, and not just the ones that uh, cause controversy. Um, all sorts of things. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it would be very unintellectual, but also showing a lack of learning. I guess 
if if any of us didn't look at things that we've done in the past and think we could have could have or should have worded them differently. Uh, so there's there's different levels to it, isn't there? Because on the one hand, there's things that you don't resile from, but you acknowledge that you could perhaps have expressed it differently or better. There's things that you do resile from and you actually change your mind on because changing your mind is fortunately one of those things that people do. And at the whole point of activism and advocacy is that you are trying, I assume, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an activist, but is that you're trying to change people's minds. Um, so my mind changes about things that I've written or said or thought in the past uh, a lot. Uh, and then you have things that you actually don't, you know, and whether it's belligerent or whether it's reasonable, you have things that you don't resile from and you don't agree that the way you worded it was inappropriate. But I'll, I'll give you two quick examples. The, the, the discussion on the project uh, yep. about the Australian article, yep. uh, I don't resile from my view. Uh, on that, I do think it was rude, uh, and I do think it was impolite, and I do think it was unnecessary. I don't think it was black and white the way, and I, I thought my article didn't make it black and white, but I don't think it's black and white that she has to either be a sort of court jester smiling for the cameras or not go. I think there are halfway houses that didn't involve the way her conduct was, but, you know, I, I, I freely accept that lots of people don't agree with me. By the way, I think Lots of people do agree with me, um, but the loudest people don't. <laughs> um, I mean, there's something that's interesting in that. Now, we must be about the same age. I'm I'm 50, right? Mm. Uh, which probably means that if somebody said I was an old fart, it'd be defamatory, but defensible in court. <laughs> and um, yeah, possibly getting to the point where over the hill would be an adequate description. One of the things that I felt, at least with some of the commentary that flowed out, and you'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from, um, particularly people who are older and looking at, looking at what went on, I suspect there were some folks who were wishing they could put a 60-year-old's head on a 27-year-old's body. And, and I'm not sure we got any of that nuance in, mm. in the discourse because it was all very... It was all very heated. You know, I can't see the world through the eyes of a 27-year-old. But, 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 Tom, let me jump in because this sort of goes to where I was going with this. So I, I don't resolve from my view, uh, and I think it's actually a view that's probably shared. I'm just the posing silent. the question. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I think it's probably a view that's shared by the silent majority. But that, in a sense, that's immaterial. I think it's completely legitimate to disagree with my position or to agree with it. The debate on the project... What, and I, I don't know if this would make those who were taking issue with me happy or unhappy, they didn't change my mind. I, I'm, I'm still very firmly, personally, of the view that it was uncalled for, if I could put it that way, and inappropriate, and she shouldn't have done it. However, on reflection, I probably wouldn't, I, I also think it was probably unnecessary for me to, to, to bother to write the opinion piece to say all of those things. I can just think it. And that's different, I should say, to saying that on reflection, I wouldn't have written the opinion piece because I didn't like the blowback that I got. I don't care about that. Um, that's not that's not a reason that I wouldn't write it on reflection. On reflection, seeing how strongly people feel about it doesn't change my view, but it probably has changed my view on whether it needed to be written. Uh, that 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 I would that I would absolutely. So, so you, re you you reckon you could have done without having written the piece on Tuesday? Yeah, that's right. And and again, I, I really want to stress not. Yeah. I really question. want to stress, though, not because of the blowback, because I don't care about that. The, the reason on reflection that I think I probably could have done without writing it is because whilst I think it, what's the point in saying it? In a sense, in a sense, me on my side of the ledger deciding to write about it became me being, I would argue, people won't like this, as bad as Grace, Grace Tame choosing to act the way she acted. Which well, I'm you, critical I mean, you, of. You effectively the journalist effectively became the story. Yeah, but that, that happens these days for better or worse. The other one that I, I want to mention... It's a problem. I mean, it, it, I, it, I think I, it's a huge problem. But right? the, the other one, Tom, part, I mean, that's partly the journalist being a commentator. It's a blurred line these days. But the other one that I wanted to mention, <laughs> with, with the, other, the other one that I wanted to mention, this, the whole macro-micro thing off of Insight is, is an interesting one. I consider it just a, an outright truism, what I said doesn't mean that on reflection, the wording of it perhaps could have been better or the timing of it could have been better and therefore 
perhaps I should have done I, it. I, I watched it. I watched that episode, and but, you know, there was a, there was a, <laughs> it wasn't a particularly easy one uh, uh, to to watch, given the, the given the obvious tensions in the room. Well, absolutely, and I didn't realise at the time, for example, just how close Annabelle Crabb was, um, particularly to Joe. Dyer, who I think had filmed for Four Corners at Annabelle's house, that came out later. Uh, and, and look, I, I didn't realise that I was being so aghast for her. Uh, and, and as it turns out to be fair, a lot of people. But having said that, so in other words, yes, that's something that on reflection I could have done differently. But I, I think the actual sentiment is a truism. At a big picture level, people want improvements on gender, I've probably written more about affirmative action for women than any male commentator in this country. I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, so at a, at, a, at a big picture level, you know, dare I say it, the macro level, that's important. That's what I said. I think that's a truism. But I also think it's just an obvious truism that at a personal level, i.e. the micro, that it's difficult when someone you know and are friends with who says they didn't do something gets accused of something. I mean, that's just a truism. That would be the case, I've, an, I've got daughters, I don't have sons, but if I had a son who was accused of something, that would be the case. A friend, it's the case. But I also appreciate much more than I did when I said that. Context matters, timing matters, and the whole point, I suppose, of there being so much violence against women and all the rest of it is that is that you need to recognise that on the simple mass of how much of it happens that needs to be stamped out, we must all have friends and or family who do that that we have to therefore accept that that's a problem now that doesn't change the truism though that we want big picture change but it's complex when someone you know is accused of it i mean i just think that's a simple truism it may it may be a truism but the, the thing is what you're telling me in, in hindsight it probably better not to express things in a way in that way given the state of the national conversation yeah, but I also I think that's right, and that is in a sense my point on both fronts. Both of those said, examples. That's what I, that's but, but, what I, but I, I find that frustrating. The... I find yeah. that I find that a little frustrating because that becomes a stifling of 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 debate, uh, and it's it's sort of a sign of where we're at. Uh, and look, I get it, I do get it, but uh, it, it's you know where where, where does that go next? Uh, I, I worry that we can't civilly disagree. Isn't that a product of the way in which both the media uh, has developed, uh, the way in which social media has entered into the discourse as well? Because isn't it great? I see evidence every day of, of a greater level of um, uh, polarisation mm. where, where public discourse looks like sitting in the, uh, uh, the grandstands at the MCG at a Collingwood Carlton game with people yelling at each other. And there's no real way in which you can cut through the noise. Yeah, I, th I think that's an issue. I, I've, um, I mean, I've fallen victim to what I'm about to describe as a criticism of journalism plenty of times. It's, it's very easy. I mean, social media can genuinely be a sewer. Um, this, you know, those with the sewer rat uh, emojis won't want to hear that, uh, but it's true. Uh, it, it, no. it, can also be a sh it can also be a shame because it, uh, you know, it, it can get in the road of what I think is such an awesome platform for discourse, potentially. Um, but I also think it's easy as a public commentator to fall into the trap of just playing to the peanut gallery. I've done it plenty of times uh, where you know that you can have your view or your criticism reinforced by the mob, um, by, you know, putting a criticism or a comment online. <laughs> The answer is not to do that because if that's how you feel and if that's how a so large you're, 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 feel, you're, you're, you're confessing to uh, to playing to the crowd. Well, we all do from time to time. I think I do it less <laughs> now than I used to because of having been on the receiving end of it. You know what I find really interesting is that there's a very short memory in social media. Yeah, uh, it's it's not only the difficulty of a civil discourse or the ability to agree to disagree. Uh, it's also that, you know, you can hold a myriad of positions relevant to a debate, which are all go one way. But then if you have the temerity, depending on what the debate is, to have another issue where you go the other way on, that's, that's all that matters. 
and, and and it's as though you're sort of some absurdly hard right or hard left figure because you've taken that view. And I don't hit the left or the right on this. I hit both. You know, if you if you lean in uh, on something that the left don't like, they tear you to shreds. But if you also lean in on something that the right don't like, they turn on you in an instant and tear you to shreds as well. I just this is I'm the, not, it's happened to me from all ends. Yeah, I don't like Team Red versus Team Blue. You know, I I think that there's there's very few there's very few topics that I think aren't contestable topics. You know, I mean there there are some obvious ones that of course they are that pertain to you know core principles that you can, in my view, not abide an alternative position on. But there are very few of those. Um, I think there's a lot of like even something. Let me give an example. Even something like changing the date. I am a passionate advocate for changing the date of Australia Day. I can see personally no reason not to when we know that it hurts so many people, particularly Indigenous Australians. Why not change it? However, I think it is a topic where you are allowed to have a contrary view on that. It's not like apartheid where I don't accept you're allowed a contrary view on that. Um, I think it is a view where you can think, no, I don't want to change the date of Australia Day. I don't agree with you. I passionately don't agree with you. But I will respect you having an alternative view. And another one is same-sex marriage. I'm a passionate advocate for same-sex marriage. I first wrote about that back in 2003. Uh, and again, I would suggest I'm, I've probably written more about it, if not than any uh, political commentator, certainly more than any I can think of. You're, um, you're asking some academic to do a PhD to, and, and getting some <laughs> empirical but, research on that, aren't you? But even though, Tom, even though that that law has been changed and as passionate as I've been about it for so long, I think it is a legitimate position to be yep. opposed to same-sex marriage. It just happens to be one that I don't agree with. Now, there is something else that happens when you're in public life and you have, um, uh, I guess... A lot of prominence. You've got platforms and people come at you from time to time. Um, and I guess it's the same in, with politicians. You've had a lot of criticism directed at you over the past 12 months. And as a professional, you probably look at it and say, you wear it. What happens at home? Oh, no, home's all right. No, I mean, look, there's, there's been moments where it hasn't been as all right because sometimes you take your work home as, as you do at any point, but very rarely. Um, you know, I, I try very hard and I'm getting better at it as well. I think the first couple of times that you cop heat, it, it becomes more of an issue at home because you're not used to it, right? So it's harder to compartmentalize um, your home life from your, from your work life, but that's become less difficult. So, I mean, look, this week with all the stuff that's happened, I've been away from home because I've been in Melbourne hosting the project. So I'm you know, sitting in a, in, a, in a hotel room as we speak. Uh, but I've been on the phone to my kids and my wife the whole time. Uh, and, you know, it, it won't come home with me because it, it just isn't occupying my time other than when it has to. Uh, and I also know that my, for what it's worth, my kids and my wife agree with me uh, on, on the issue that I've taken the stand on this week. They all, I think all three of them would agree. I, I think they've all told me this, that there was no need to write it. Uh, which sort of goes a little bit to some of the reflection that oh, I had yeah, after. The... Uh, well, 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 so, so your wife and your your daughter have basically said, "Think it, but for heaven's sake, shut up." Well, just don't feel the need to write it, given what she's been through. Uh, I think was the collective on that one. Oh, so okay. they, they, so they, they, you know, they they completely agree that it was uncalled for and that she shouldn't have done it. Uh, look, I don't want to verbalise where they stand. So this is, in a sense, this is for all of them to I, to have their own views on. But that was the sense I got. But the point, the point, getting back to your question, at risk of talking too much about that and therefore uh, at the other side of this podcast, bringing my work home, the the, the point is that I, I, it doesn't affect us at home. And we're a pretty robust family debating and talking about politics and policy issues, as you would imagine. You know, my girls are, are fiercely engaged. You know, my youngest daughter in particular is right into her debating. Um, my oldest daughter doesn't debate anymore, but she's, uh, you know, she certainly does at home. Um, my, my wife would be the absolute opposite of a shrinking violet. Um, she's an infinitely more successful career uh, person than I am. 
uh, and they have strong views and they don't feel the most remote need to hold it back. So, so if, if work comes home, it comes home because we talk about the issues, uh, the, the challenges as they affect you as a human being, you know, almost entirely don't. Uh, and, and that becomes something that, you know, you're, I, I think the way to put that would be that everyone, but, you know, on the subject of this that we're talking about, your, uh, your armour and your skin becomes thicker and more leathery and you also become more cognizant that the odd occasion where you do yep. take something home, you know, you realize for next time, I'm not going to do that. Um, so you deliberately avoid it. So yeah. And that, look, and the only advice I'd give for anyone listening uh, who who does bring things home, whether it's this sort of thing or something else, that that's, that's the, that that's all you can do. I think, I, I think it is infinitely better not to uh, rather than to fall in the trap of doing it. Peter, uh, you've been extremely generous with your time today and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, you, the books that you've written you know, are generally available everywhere, aren't they? Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, I've got to work out what the next one is. Uh, Wayne and I have got something on the hop, but we've just got to get moving on it. It might take a little bit of time. So, yeah, the, the, I've been talking to Peter Van Onselen, the political, the political commentator for the Australian, the political editor for the 10 Network, a professor uh, and a person who's gone through the process of getting a doctorate as well about a whole range of issues. Peter, thank you so much for joining me. Great chatting to you, Tom. Cheers, man. Uh, thank you.